Well, it seems that as long as people have been getting old, they've been wishing they didn't really have to. Most religions offer a form of immortality in which a construct called the soul manages to survive the death of the body. And yet, despite this age-old preoccupation, the amazing thing is that actual research into the processes of aging has actually only begun in the relatively last little while. Even though, even though, we proclaim it at CARP that we've all gained an amazing 20 years of life expectancy in the last 50, 60 years alone. So when you're organizing a conference, every once in a while the god of conferences reaches out and just as you're preparing a certain subject, an uh, author appears, a book appears, and lo and behold, somebody has spent years gathering the data, reviewing the history, and we have such a man luckily with us, he's David Stipp, and he comes bearing the news that anti-aging drugs are no longer a distant prospect for us all, and that possibly a youth pill, while not imminent, may well within our lifetimes and his, <coughs> deliver us some form of a pill that might delay the onset of some of the conditions unpleasant that we associate with aging. Where's David? Here he is. David, thank, thank you. you. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking Moses and the CARP organization for inviting me here to speak today about a subject that's very close to my heart, both personally and professionally. Uh, and I, what I'd like to do is give you a quick, just a quick flyover of some of the research that I find so exciting in this area. Uh, but first, I'd like to begin by uh, just relating a couple of quick centenarian anecdotes that I find particularly telling about the whole aging situation. A few years ago, I had the great good fortune to uh, run across this thing called the New England Centenarian Study in Boston, and uh, uh, as its name suggests, they're studying centenarians, and I got to know a few of the, of the participants in this study, one of them a woman named Catherine McCaig. And I think when, when, whenever we meet a centenarian, I think our first um, inclination, uh, uh, scientists are the same, is to ask, what in the world have you done so right to live so long and so well? And uh, I mean, that question partly uh, is informed by the fact that only about one in 10,000 people actually makes it to 100. So there's something very extraordinary is going on here. And one wonders what it is about their lifestyle th that might account for this extraordinarily graceful aging. So one day I took uh, Catherine out to lunch. We went to a seafood restaurant and uh, we sat down. It came time to order and she, she to my uh, amazement, ordered this large platter of deep fried fish and chips. <laughs> and, uh, and so I sat there watching over my, my chaste little salad as she <laughs> devoured this entire, this entire rather large meal with what I thought was, was almost wonderfully appalling gusto. And so I asked, <laughs> I asked Catherine, I said, Catherine, is this the way you've always eaten? And, and she said, she looked over and said, well, David, I, I always just ate whatever came along as long as it wasn't moving. <laughs> and, uh, so anecdote number two, I, I happened to meet another centenarian not too long ago, uh, the grandfather of one of my old college chums. And I, I was in the same mode with him, asking him a bit about his lifestyle and diet and everything. And, and he bursts out and says, you know, I'm famous in my family for my sweet tooth, and you cannot leave a box of chocolates around the house that's open with me, because I've, I've been known for sitting down and eating an entire box of chocolates at one sitting, and then I li generally like to chase it, have a chaser of a couple of glasses of ginger ale after that. So uh, this is the kind of thing that for me would probably end my life right there on the spot. <laughs> uh, and I think what these two anecdotes say is that we're not going to find out a whole lot by asking about the lifestyle of centenarians, because these extraordinary people, I think, probably carry genes that protect them from a lot of the, the things that, that uh, go wrong with us as we get old. And um, I think this is very encouraging, because if we can identify those genes 
it seems very likely to me that we would be able to emulate their effects with drugs that might enable us to move to, to, to age as gracefully as Catherine and, and my friend Lauren Reed have aged. And that, that field is actually, that area of centenarian research is really coming along quite well. I don't have time to go into the details. Ask me about it later if you want. But uh, I just want to maybe stop parenthetically here and insert so I, I don't forget and run out of time. The goal of this research that, that, that excites me so much here is not radical life extension. It's not rejuvenation. It's to develop preventive medicines that we could take fairly early in our adulthood that would push off and postpone everything that goes wrong with us as we age. I mean, not just fatal diseases like Alzheimer's and cancer and heart disease, but all the other things too, like osteoporosis and hearing loss, and even things like wrinkles. And uh, this would have a very profound effect. I think it would be uh, offer more promise than anything else out there in medical research right now. So the evidence that I think we're getting close to being able to intervene in the aging process and actually slow it down, um, I think is largely comes from animal studies. And some of this evidence goes way back. Uh, I think actually the first uh, Geronto engineers, so to speak, uh, people who were really good at interfering with the rate of aging and slowing it down were actually at work several hundred years ago and actually got quite good at what they were doing. Uh, so so who, who were these, these uh, secret magic alchemists of aging? They were dog breeders. Now, um, the dog probably descended from gray wolves about, probably first domesticated around 15,000 years ago. Uh, but only in the past three or 400 years have, have dogs really, dog breeders, really gone to town and spun out all the diverse breeds of dogs that we see around us today with all their amazing variability in size and shape. While they were selecting for genes that control size and shape, dog breeders were inadvertently, without realizing it, selecting also for genes that control the rate of aging. We can see the results today in a very striking correlation between body size and lifespan in dogs. Large dogs like uh, Irish Wolfhounds and St. Bernards live on gen in general only about six to eight years on average. Small dogs like Chihuahuas and Toy Poodles live something like twice that long. I mean, this is a very big disparity in age. And what's even more interesting, uh, in recent years, scientists have discovered that a single gene is largely responsible for this big disparity in age. It's, it's called the insulin-like growth factor one gene. And it's also responsible for the great disparity in body weight among different breeds of dogs. So this is a truly flabbergasting uh, result because I think for a very long time, scientists presume that aging is just random damage. There's no genetic rhyme or reason to it. There's, there's nothing we could do about it because of that. But what this suggests is that there is some sort of genetic module in the canine genome that actually has a kind of rheostat on it, a single gene rheostat. We can find variants of this single gene, IGF-1, and slightly tweak them and get a very dramatic effect on the rate of aging in these animals. So we all know that dogs are this incredibly plastic species. I mean, uh, it's, it's not hard to see that. Just look at all the different breeds we have around. So maybe this plasticity of aging is just a dog thing. So what's, what's, what's this, the, the situation on that? I think to get at the answer to this question, whether or not it's simply a dog thing, it, it, we have to look at, at a phenomenon called calorie restriction. Uh, as many of you may have heard, this is uh, something that was discovered in the 1930s. Uh, if you reduce the normal calorie intake of a rat by about a third, the rule of thumb is, you get about a 30 to 40 percent increase in life, healthy lifespan. Uh, important to add healthy. We're talking about health span as well as lifespan here. We're not prolonging misery at the end of life. Um, this, this very striking result kind of sat on, on science's back shelf for a long time, but a number of scientists did look into it and they tried it in different species. And wonderfully, it works in almost every species that's been tried in. They now include protozoa, guppies, hamsters, mice, dogs. Uh, and most recently last year, there was some very compelling evidence that came out suggesting that it also works in rhesus monkeys, so we're getting pretty close to ourselves. 
So the implication of this research to me is that there is an anti-aging module that evolution, the blind watchmaker of evolution, to, to, to use Richard Dawkins' woody term, uh, kind of invented millions of years ago and that has been highly conserved through evolutionary time. Different uh, variations of it exist in different species, but it, it probably exists not only through all these other species, but right up uh, to include humans too. So th this module probably also offers a chance to find drugs that would switch on a pre-existing anti-aging mechanism and, and get the results that we want. There's also some other evidence um, that's even in, in a way more striking that, that I think is really brought home to people that, that, that such a module exists, and that is the discovery about 20 years ago that mutations in a single gene in these little worms called nematodes could actually more than double their lifespans. And a few years later, a similar finding in mice showing that a single gene mutation could increase their lifespan by about 50%. Again, this is healthy lifespan we're talking about. So these, these discoveries really have, I think, a big overarching implication that's very exciting. And that is, we do not have to solve the monster problem of how aging happens at the level of, of molecules and cells, which is uh, just baffling. It's still not well understood because evolution has solved the problem for us and very conveniently uh, set up this kind of anti-aging module embedded in the genome that, that we could probably find drugs to turn on and cause a lot of complicated downstream effects that would slow the rate of aging. Now, so you might ask, of course, how close are we to, to being able to do this? Well, last year, scientists for the first time, in my opinion, showed that we could very, uh, very significantly extend lifespan in mammals with a drug. This was uh, a finding that, that didn't get all that much attention, in fact, much less than I think it should have. And may, many of you may not even uh, know the name of the drug. It's called rapamycin. It's now on the market. It's been on the market as pr a prescription drug for quite a while to treat and prevent rejection of transplanted organs. Um, rapamycin, I'm not saying... I, I don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that rapamycin is a magic anti-aging bullet. This, this drug has significant side effects in humans, which probably rules out its use as a, a kind of anti-aging medicine for people. But there are several things ex very exciting about this discovery that, that I think give us real reason to hope. One is uh, the finding was made in three different labs at the same time. They ran parallel experiments in mice, and so they all got pretty much the same results. So this looks to be a very robust finding, unlike many other previous claims uh, about substances that supposedly slowed aging. Second, this drug was given to the mice late in their lives. It's something uh, that seems very important to me and maybe to others in this room. The mice were about 20 months of old, old when they first got the drug, which is about the equivalent, human equivalent of about 60. Uh, before this result, people thought nothing would work in animals that old. But astoundingly, uh, it actually in increased their life expectancy by a third at that age, as well as their life expectancy at birth by a little over 10%. So um, I think we're getting close. There, there was one other aspect of that uh, finding that I just wanted to quickly throw out, and that was it seems that rapamycin works by mimicking the effects of calorie restriction, which would enable us to get the gain without the pain of the hunger, the infertility in women, the other side effects of calorie restriction that pretty much rule it out as a kind of anti-aging intervention for the masses. Um, so since we know how rapamycin works and we think it mimics calorie restriction, we're, we have a real head start now and trying to figure out other drugs that might be more benign that would have similar effects. So uh, just quickly, what, what would be the um, implications of that for human medicine? Well, at this point, it's getting very hard to increase our life expectancy. We've already gotten so good at boosting longevity that we're sort of like Olympic milers with regard to, to longevity, and even making incremental gains is hard. Um, so this gain that we might gain with rapamycin, which would perhaps increase human li life expectancy by maybe about nine years if we could do in people what we can now do in mice, um, would actually be quite large. And to give you an idea how large it is, it's estimated that if we could completely wipe out cancer, if we could totally cure it, 
it would increase life expectancy by only about three years. Now, the reason the gain would be so surprisingly small is that so many things are competing to kill us when we get to be 75 or 80, that even if we completely eliminated one cause of mortality, something else would, would kind of step up to the plate and, and, and hit us out of the park before long. So um, do the math. If we could get nine years of healthy, healthy quality time years with an anti-aging drug that worked like rapamycin in mice, it would be the equivalent of winning the war on cancer three times over. I mean, th this to me is big news. And uh, it seems to me that the medical establishment, as well as the FDA and other regulatory bodies and the drug industry, should have jumped all over this and be putting major bucks into trying to turn this very promising basic research into clinically proven drugs that, that, that really do what they, they say they do. Uh, but they're not. And that, to me, is um, a subject that, it's a big subject, it's complicated, and, and I don't want to go into it too much because it will raise my blood pressure and shorten my life. <laughs> but I, I think the, the overarching thing about, about this, this um, kind of failure of the, the, the drug industry and others to, to really push this, this research forward it, is that the medical establishment doesn't really yet recognize aging as a treatable condition. Doctors and medical researchers and the people who hold the purse strings uh, have really uh, spent their entire careers mainly thinking about diseases of aging. Aging itself, normal aging, is regarded as this sort of given. It's not a disease. It's not something that we think we can even do anything about. So they basically have, have sort of ignored it. The FDA in the U.S. does not con consider aging a condition that can be treated with FDA-approved prescription drugs. And that means that the drug industry has no economic incentive to put billions of dollars into developing and testing an anti-aging drug. They could never recoup their cost by selling it as a dietary supplement for very little profit. So where does it, what does this all add up to? I think, unfortunately, um, we're sort of stuck between the research and development stages in this whole developing game. I think it's, you know, it's very exciting. I think we are on the brink of an anti-aging revolution. But I at this point, uh, we're, we're sort of stuck. The good news, however, is that in the past, we had to reach into this kind of monstrous barrel of snakes in order to try to <coughs> seize on something that would slow aging. <coughs> we don't have to do that anymore because we always came out, of course, coated with snake oil when we did that. We don't have to do that anymore. <coughs> At this point, I think it's mainly a matter of exerting political and social will to move forward with what we've already done in science. Uh, and so it's a matter of really having the medical establishment wake up to what's happened in aging science and seize the day. And uh, for reasons that are, for personal reasons that are maybe all too obvious, I'm, I'm hoping that, that this happens really soon, and, and I hope you do too. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Thank Outstanding, you. really. Thank you.